governance. I'm not only just talking politics, but in governance. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Now, I have a few slides I'll run through, and then we'll get to the meat of the problem. Now, this is our history. To date, we have experienced 16 military and democratic administrations up to right now. And has any of them worked? Please, this is a, an interactive class. Has they, have they worked? Why? Now, I'll tell you why. One of the main reasons why our government has not worked is that our perception of governance has been corrupted by the military incursion into the process. So we have come to think, because when the military gets into power, you can't talk. They do what they like. Nobody can challenge them. So by the time they hand over to a civilian administration, they are also acting like, who are you to challenge us? And because we have learned, like Pastor Podu said, we have learned, we have learned helplessness. We have learned to keep quiet because the military won't allow us to talk. We drifted into this apathy of thinking, even with the democratic process, we are not supposed to talk. And that's why they have not worked, because we have not done what we are supposed to do. So while in theory, we are practicing what we call the democracy, but in principle, I think what we're practicing is a militocracy. Our democracy is still, there's still too much strain of military rulership that has infected our democracy. And so, can you look at the words I have there on, this, on that screen? And those are the typical adjectives we associate with leadership in Nigeria. There, there's impunity. They are authoritarian. They are oppressive. They are unaccountable. Privileged class. You can't question them. Rapid partisanship. Cluelessness. These are adjectives we used to describe our, our leadership in Nigeria, right? Now, this is the, do, you, do you identify yourself here? Do you identify yourself here? Are you frustrated? Are you oppressed? Are you limited? Angry youth? Are you hungry? Unsafe? Now, this is what followership experiences. This is how we feel. The first um, things I put on the screen is how we see the people in leadership. How do we correct all of these things? Now, the relationship between leadership and followership is the focus of my uh, short presentation. The relationship between leadership and followership. There is a disconnect between leadership and followership. Am I right? Followers are now sitting, they feel very irrelevant, and so there's apathy in the land. And that's the reason I was watching your reaction to the two speakers that, that were before me. And there were times when they said some things that, in the days when we were in the bottle and we were called gin, you know, but our new go, gin, we would have jumped, stood on our chair, and we are ready to go. But I checked the reaction. In fact, when somebody said, go and ask for the budget of your local government, everybody said, hmm. <laughs> That's apathy. Because we have learned that they will give you, or you will not get it. And because of that learned helplessness, we think there's nothing we can do about it. That's not true. There's so much we can do about it. Um, leadership is taking advantage of this, your learned helplessness. That disinterest is what is keeping our leadership the way they are. They are the way they are because we are the way we are. If we stop being the way we are, they will not have any choice but to be different. And I'm going to prove that to you this morning. We are the, they are the way they are because we allow them to be the way they are. Because we've just assumed there's nothing we can do. How can just the sheer number of people in this auditorium right now, if we are all on one page and we decide we want to make something happen, can't we make it happen? So the problem is that we're not on one page. Yes or no? Because some of us feel, is it worth the trouble? Some of us feel, we have tried it before, it didn't work. And because of that, everybody is sitting down and thinking, 
God will send an angel who will come and become the president of this Nigeria and just wave his wand, we, and everything will be fine. I hate to bust your bubble. No angel is coming from anywhere. We are the ones who will make that change. I will show you how. So to prevent the followership from dismantling this, their house of cards, which they are living on, they distract us. Partisanship. You know, I'm very active on Facebook. People who know me know that. And I don't know the number of wars I fight just because I express an opinion that is not popular. And it is always because she's ABC. I am PDP. You are whatever. And because of that, we don't listen to ourselves. We're no longer listening to ourselves. And you know what I find very interesting about this? Is that these guys, when it gets to the place where they are sharing this loot, there is no PDP or APCO. There is none. I'm telling you because I've worked in the corridors of power. I understand what I'm saying. So it is actually us against them. But they tell us the dummy of thinking it's my party. Once my party is in place, maybe it will reach me. So because of that, you are defending the indefensible. Simply because you feel that person is my enemy. Uh, because he's of another party. It's a distraction. Ethnicity. It's because he's Igbo, that's why they put him in jail. It's because he's your I mean, why all those people stole your money. But once they capture your one person, the first thing you hear is, hey, why is it not the APC person they capture? Why don't you let them capture this PDP person first? So that when another party comes in, it will capture the APC one. Because there will be precedence. But no, we'll be defending people who have taken your commonwealth and have stacked it in places and using it to train their own children. Because they say, I am your brother. I remember one time when some, one of them in this, I don't want to mention their names, one of them in the Senate went to some um, tribunal. And that was the day he remembered he was Igbo. Wore the Igbo traditional outfit and showed up there. He didn't have to say anything. Of course, his tribesmen on social media went wild. They are persecuting our son. What has your son done for you? So please, not today. All this ethnic division is a distraction. And it is a political tool that is being used against us as a nation. They have plenty in their arsenal, though. There's religion. Christian. We have a crisis on our hands. We have Nigerians being slaughtered daily for stupid reasons. Instead of all of us to come together and fight what is causing that slaughter, we've started to make it, ah, they are slaughtering Christians. No, they are slaughtering Muslims. So please, if it was Muslims they slaughter, they're not human beings. Are they not Nigerians? So why is it only when they slaughter Christians that the church will stand up? Why have we never spoken up for when they slaughter the Muslims? Are they not Nigerians? Are they not, did God not create them? So you understand that all of these things that we agree with them to help them spread, they're all distractions. To take our eyes away from the real McCoy. The real McCoy is the power that translates to money. Then, they have the distraction of drama. Look, Nigeria is the drama capital of the whole world. <laughs> Every week, it's one week, one drama. And once they begin that drama, we all get involved in it. We take sides. We become actors with them. So while we are busy debating whether somebody should jump out of a car or not, by the time they close the door and they share the loot, it won't matter whether he jumped out or not, but we, we are still fighting each other on the outside. And somebody is saying because he jumped out of a car, he's a hero. If that is the standard of our hero in Nigeria, we are, our, our standards are in the gutter. Then we have all kinds of frivolities. Every day we are quarreling with each other over nothing. Instead of focusing on the real issue, governance is not a joke. Governance is serious business. But they distract us so that they can, we can leave them to do what they need to do or what they are used to doing. And in the end, we are the worst for it. Is that how we want to continue? We need to ask ourselves a question. Now, I know that my...
fellow members of the media core will take me up on this, but I'm here to speak the truth. I'm a media practitioner, but the media is a major enabler of this disconnect. The media is, they amplify these distractions that throws all of us into a frenzy. Meanwhile, their role in a democracy, because they have a primary role, they have a, a very a constitutionally pro protected role, is to set the agenda for good governance. So it is the media that should be asking the real questions so that the followers can have something to take to their, uh, uh, whoever it is that is in, in, in office and demand from them. But the media will splash, this one jumps out of a car, that's the headline. In a nation where there is no light, in a nation where the hospitals don't work, in a nation where schools don't exist because people just go and spend time in a place that they don't learn nothing. That's what is on our headlines every day. And we said the media is one of our major problems in Nigeria. And I am calling on my fellow media practitioners. It is time to stop it. We need to stop buying their... Don't let me use the word. This is national television. So what must we do? <laughs> I didn't say that. I may mean it. <laughs> what do we need to do? What we need to do is what we call, what I call citizen engagement. Let me just read it from here, because I can't see too far into... Okay, right. I looked up the meaning of citizen engagement, and one meaning from the UN Public Administration's glossary says, it implies the involvement, I underlined some words, I told you I'm a teacher of sorts. It implies the involvement of citizens in a wide range of policy-making activities. Please, whether somebody jumped from a car or not, is that a policy-making activity? So why do you get involved in it? Why do you bother? Why do you, why do you take the bait? If they throw those things at us severally and we refuse to catch the bait, will they not stop throwing it? But they know us now. The president said you are an angry youth. Everybody goes crazy. Oh, lazy. Okay, he says you are a lazy youth. You go mad. My question to you, you know, if you don't know how to turn people's crap against them, you will always be a victim. Because if I were you, I am no longer a youth, so I didn't feel he was talking about me. But if I was a youth, my question to him,